Uh, and the topic is, do we really need the oceans? Uh, this is part two. Uh, I hope you've uh, taken advantage of the break. Now we're going to have to, we've been discussing a lot about fisheries and the stuff that we extract out of the oceans when it comes to food. We haven't talked about, and we, we kind of mentioned that the oceans do other things that just provide us with food. But um, there's actually, there's actually a bit of, um, a bit of concern about climate change and the oceans, isn't there? You kind of allude to it, Maria. But one of the things I've been reading a lot about is that um, the ocean is becoming a little bit more acidic. And that's a bit of a problem, is it not? Absolutely. Now, ocean acidification, well, the oceans are not going below pH 7, which is what acid is. However, the oceans are going from a mean of pH 8.2 to they might go to 7.8. Doesn't sound much, but it's a massive increase in the number of hydrogen ions that are in the ocean. Well, what's, what's, say, a glass of water in comparison? Uh, glass, uh, uh, it's very basic. Closer to 8, 8.5. So 8 is where you want to be, is it? Yeah, you'd want the oceans to stay at 8. But the interesting thing about ocean acidification, there's some other insidious things that are associated with ocean acidification. Number one, you put CO2 into water, you have something that's called hypercapnia. Now, all of us know that you asphyxiate. You actually die if you get too much CO2. That's people kill themselves by taking too much CO2. What does CO2 do? It's narcotic. CO2 is a big narcotic substance, and what's happening is the increase of CO2 into seawater is just knocking them out. Oh, just go to sleep. Well, I might not wake up. I might just die. That's what's happening. So CO2 is um, increasing CO2 is you've got a direct acid effect. You've got a hypercapnic effect, which is called acidosis. Anyone who does human physiology knows that you don't want to go acidotic. And the third effect is you increase the amount of CO2 in the oceans, you decrease the amount of calcium carbonate availability. So you have animals that can have great difficulty now making a skeleton. What is the one thing that makes skeleton, which is a huge habitat provider? Coral reefs. So if coral reefs decalcify, which means they don't exist anymore, corals turn into a bunch of squishy anemones, well, you've got no habitat. Well, you lose the biodiversity. But it's not just corals. I mean, corals is, is the most obvious case, but you're talking about a whole mo anything that has a shell yeah. can't actually manufacture a shell. Well, actually, the, the most difficult and most worrisome part on the planet are the, is the poles. Arctic. Co you know, everyone knows you've got colder water. You get more oxygen in colder water, you'll get more CO2 into colder water. So Antarctica, which is not only warming faster than anywhere else on the planet, it's also getting more acidic than anywhere else on the planet. So calcifiers in the Southern Ocean are no longer being able to make a shell. The calcifiers are people, uh, those creatures that need creatures. to make a, make a things, shells. Yeah. fish eat, fish food. We're losing our fish food. Well, there you go. Tracy. I'm a little bit worried about you. Um, you stalk seals. Now, leopard seals. Leopard seals. So, yeah. you know, bad ones. Why? Why don't you just leave them alone? What's the point of stalking them and tagging them and plugging them with stuff? What's the story there? Everyone's got to have a job. <laughs> this um, is your sick habit, is it? Um, the, the work that, that we do, uh, our part of the program, so it follows on from what Marie was talking about, um, where our work is on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, and that's the, the place on Earth where the, the, the highest uh, change in temperatures being, being found. And up until this year, they thought it was just on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, and with satellite imagery, they've worked out this year that it's actually all of the Western Antarctic. It's actually much broader than they thought. So you've got this high air temperatures, high water temperatures, we're losing sea ice, we've uh, krill are down by 80% over the last 30 years, um, a daily penguins disappeared in the area 15 years ago, um, there's, they're looking for evidence, more evidence now of, uh, of um, um, ocean acidification resulting in changes within the, the invertebrate community that have uh, calcareous shells and uh, our job stalking leopard seals, comes into looking at, uh, we've been invited to, to move over there, because we've worked in the East Antarctic before where nothing much is happening, to look at the difference between the top predators, so things like the leopard seals and other seals and whales, and look at the difference in population between there and the, in the West, 
and in, in the East. And so we've been looking at an um, array of different sorts of things and trying to look back in time, because the changes happened about 50 years ago, and so we want to look back before that 50-year change. So looking at changes in food is one of the things we've been um, uh, um, hammering at. We were talking before about stable isotopes. It's actually useful for you as well, because in your hair, um, you can tell um, your foraging behaviour or feeding <laughs> behaviour, but also your drug-taking behaviour, and you wonder why athletes never have any hair. <laughs> anyway, um, so they're shaved. They, sh they are shaved. Mm, all of them. It's for you know anti friction. Yeah, right. Um, and um, why do you need to shave your anyway? Um, and but stable isotopes are great because it's a signature of what the animals were eating, and they're very stable. So it means we can go back and look at museum samples and look back. 150 years ago, 100 years ago, and look at what the animals were eating. And what we found off the Western Antarctic Peninsula is that the animals, the top order predators, the leopard seals, are no longer top order predators. They just now eat krill. And so I'm saying krill are down by 80% over the last 30 years. So it's called a trophic collapse when everything starts to, to, to look focused down on, on a depleting source. And you know how I was saying the Adata penguins disappeared about 15 years ago? They were replaced by another species of, of penguin that likes open water and not fish by um, chinstrap penguins and gentoo penguins. And last year, our, um, our Polish colleagues was, have seen a decrease in 60 by 60% in the um, chinstrap penguins. So again, we're, we've come on board looking at um, changes in, in, in their behaviour as well and their foraging behaviour. And in looking at the, um, so a change in food doesn't make any difference. The animals are actually shrinking and they've shrunk by, the leopard cells have shrunk by 10% over the last, since the 1950s. When you say krill, because it's not on most people's menu, could you explain what krill is and why it's important when you say something like 60% down, it actually means something significant? 80% down. 80% down. There you go. The krill, little guys, about this big, they live for about five years. Shrimp. And yeah, they're a shrimp. And uh, they, they're basically the driving house of the Antarctic. Everything pretty much is centred on it. So they're eating the phytoplankton that Maria, were talk Maria was talking about that's taking up the, um, the, the carbon dioxide. In fact, the Southern Ocean's carbon sink is starting to deplete. Its ability to take in carbon is actually starting to shift over the last few years, which is also very disturbing. So the krill, these little guys, they're eaten by whales, by seals, by penguins. They're, um, they're also fish. fish. They're, they're like the the, um, the centerpiece of, of the Antarctic. So, and the reason you're looking at, the reason, the reason you harass seals mm, um, is because <laughs> as a top water predator, you can, they go where the food is. So they actually give you a, a sense of what's happening in the food chain, don't they? The top water predator, if you think about all the, the, the things that are on the World Wildlife Fund's like hit list, tigers, lions, they're all top water predators. Your top water predators, there's usually not that many of them and they're more vulnerable to change. What went missing in Tasmania, the thylacine, we work on them too. Um, and that basically, the, the top water predators are more sensitive to when change is going to happen, and, and, and that's what we see. So that's where the, the marlin fishery is actually quite, quite disturbing. Um, and uh, so for us, with the work we were working with a whole stack of other people looking at other parts within the system, the glaciologists looking at changes in the glaciers, the oceanographers looking at changes in ocean chemistry, sediments, etc., etc. So we're a piece in this big, massive puzzle, but it's an important piece. So stalking seals can be very, very, very fun, but it's also very important. Well, there is, as we discussed a little bit earlier, there is one top water predator that's doing rather well, isn't that, Brad? <laughs> yeah, it's us. We're doing okay. There's what, nine billion of us now, something like that? But um, we're probably the uh, we're the gun, um, um, I suppose, resource user on the planet, but there's probably a hell of a lot more ants and cockroaches around there, so we're, we're probably not the greatest uh, species in number of abundance. Anyway, but... Um, well, we should talk about those species that don't have a particular benefit to us, but, you know, actually they do stuff, don't they? I mean, I, I wanted to ask sea cucumbers, can we actually put them in a salad, Maria? <laughs> oh, you can if you're Chinese. Really? And good for the libido as well. So what do they do? What do seeking numbers I mean, look, there's a whole ecosystem out if there. If I know the Chinese, they're an aphrodisiac. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> well, they poo a lot. They eat a lot. And that's they nutrients? We a lot. So the one thing 
which is important in, syst uh, in a lot of marine systems is how on earth can you have such biodiversity when there's nothing to eat? Well, the whole thing can be driven by big things that eat sand. And these sea cucumbers eat sand, poo it. They're like the vacuum cleaners of the reef, keeping the place in good nick. So they're like your house cleaner. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, if you, and my daughter thought it was a big joke. She gave me a Christmas present, and the card had the back end of a sea cucumber pooing, and she thought it was a big joke for mom. <laughs> but there, there, there are a whole range of things, ecosystem services, they call yeah. them, um, that we don't... We, we blindly ignore, but actually is done by this range of biodiversity out there. It's not like it's not like we don't need the oceans and we don't need what marine life does. Can you give us a couple of examples of kind of benefits that we as a species and all species benefit from having marine life? Well, from the oceans, uh, our weather. We wouldn't have rain if it wasn't the, the you know, we didn't have the oceans. And look at what rain does for us. Yeah. Puts, puts water in the river. It's not bad. They it? draw it out down the brewery. They make beer out of it. <laughs> We're at the pub tonight. Do we need the ocean? Of course we do. Next question. Wow. So, we wouldn't have beer if we didn't have the ocean. That's fantastic. Now, you've got to walk me through it, Tracy. Remember, I'm a journalist, so you need to walk me through it very simply. Um, how do we get rain from the oceans? Well... Um, the the warm as the air goes over the over the ocean, the the it picks up the water from the as the warm air picks up the water. As it goes over colder colder areas, the the water will actually drop out. So that's how it's um, driving. Particularly coastal areas have have a lot more um, a lot more water. And one of the problems with changes happening in the southern ocean. Uh, is that those weather systems, those big weather warm uh, storm systems, are moving further south. And so in South Australia and places like that, that's why we're seeing more droughts. So we're not getting those big weather, weather cells coming across, dumping that water onto, onto the land. So we're missing out. So we, weather, weather patterns are changing, but uh, don't they always change? I mean, the history of the Earth shows patterns changing over time. Uh, what is, is the impact that is our, act, our, our activities, outside of fishing, just uh, our activities that are leading to climate change, is that changing those patterns and is it changing it for the worse? Yeah, well, there's about, I think there's about 23 different models going at the, at the moment about how climate change will impact um, different areas. But for Australia, pretty much most of those models are saying less, um, uh, less rain, more fire, and more, um, what's it called? bigger changes, fluctuations in natural events, sort of like bigger storms, bigger tide events, those sorts of things. And uh, so most of the models all confer that that's going to be our, our um, inheritance. Well, come on, we could get around this. Being top-level predators and being as smart as we are to be able to make beer from rain. We um, could eat our way out. Well, not necessarily <laughs> out. Top-level predators. Interesting idea. Um, it's kind of think our way out of it. What about thinking our way out of it? I mean... Um, uh, ocean uh, fertilisation, that's been one suggestion, to increase the amount of uh, carbon that can be absorbed by the ocean. Is that an option? Well, uh, it's a... I it's think a dangerous it, one. It's a dangerous one. We it's have option, no yeah. idea. Can you explain what, what ocean fertilisation is? Okay, what it is is that, just like we all have nutrient deficiencies, if you're an adolescent girl that decides they want to be a vegan, you better have iron tablets. And then the doctor says, well, there's no replacement for meat. Well, I'm going to have iron anyway, with from, and I'm definitely going to be a vegan. Well, the ocean, in the ocean, there's a lot of, just like your back guard, there'll be nutrients that plants really crave. It's nitrogen and phosphorus, and you fertilize your garden, you get a beautiful tree. Now, you can do the same thing with the ocean. And one of the nutrients that's limiting in the ocean is iron. So there's a notion of, let's just sprinkle, let's give the ocean a big iron tablet and let's get a lot more phytoplankton, which will take a lot more of the CO2 out of the atmosphere and it'll all be fixed. But we have no idea of what the side effects of eating, having too much iron. Now, if my vegan daughter has too much iron, well, it might not be good for her liver. You know, we have no idea what the side effects of fertilizing So it might actually create is. more problems. We'll, I mean... We don't know. We don't know. It's it, a, it'll create a lot more um, um, 
it can actually change the water chemistry. And when you have massive phytoplankton blooms, you can get, you know, the red tides, and it becomes toxic. Lots of other things die. Um, and so we're just not sure. They've done um, an experiment in the Antarctic doing exactly this, so, so the iron fertilisation. You get these massive blooms, and just a tiny amount of iron will actually um, bring down a lot of carbon. So it actually does offer some promise, but because we don't know what the side effects could be, it is quite... It's quite dangerous. And I've heard that whale poop is uh, incredibly beneficial to the oceans. They apparently, <laughs> absorb, they apparently absorb as twice the amount of CO2 from the atmosphere that they contribute through respiration. I wouldn't want to be a scuba diver underneath a whale that was <laughs> dropping out a number two. That's why there aren't that many of them. <laughs> um, yeah, well... Um, Getting back to Wales, it was interesting, a, a point that Tracy made before. She said that the krill was 80% um, down on what it has historically been, and um, uh, whales are eating it. Well, there's a lot more whales out there at the moment, so maybe that's the reason why there's not as much krill around, because there's heaps of more whales. Oh, no, the, the whale stock is nowhere near the capacity to be able to take down the amount of krill. But, good point... Forget about the Japanese and whales. These animals are going to hit like a food shortage. And so the couple of animals that get taken is going to be really different compared to the a number of animals that, that we're going to see you know, changes to. And last year off the Western Australian coast, there were 75 humpbacks washed up, juvenile humpbacks washed up dead, uh, which we've never seen in our kind of time. So probably a shortage of food in the area that they were, and I, we'll see more of that. And I, the um, New South Wales um, National Parks and Wildlife Service are absolutely hell scared. I won't say SHIT scared, but uh, imagine having like all these humpback whales on Sydney beaches, Bondi Beach, and so they're awfully worried about because that's what we're going to start to potentially. To well, potentially you've, you've see. kind of raised something that we should, I guess, we might feel guilty about. It's not just that we're changing the climate by warming our atmosphere. It's not just that uh, we've got more nutrient runoff probably than it should be as a result of farms. But apparently, you know, whales and dolphins, uh, they, they're, they're having a problem with the amount of noise that we're generating. Sonar and high frequency and low frequency sonar and radar. These are apparently um, affecting. And, and they, they're, they're quite sensitive to this, is that right? Well, they're very acoustic animals. They, um, so I hear. Well, the, um, anybody who saw Flipper used to... Used to um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, the ocean's actually... So the, the, they, they echolocate, um, so they use acoustics to locate their, um, I suppose, um, to find out about their surroundings as well as locate their prey. But it's interesting that we you talk about acoustics um, because there's um, work being done at the moment um, with regards to utilising acoustics um, to minimise interactions of um, whales and dolphins with set fishing gear. Oh, really? These things are called pingers and um, uh, they're being used um, um, up in northern Queensland at the moment and um, being trialled and they've been pretty successful. Does so, that, so does that mean that with the pingers, the whales will avoid the fishing gear? The, 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 the particular pingers that have been um, utilised at the moment are for for, for dolphins, the frequency is set for uh, a frequency that um, dolphins can um, pick up on and um, just alerts them to the fact that there's something there and um, they stay away from it. The, um, the world's oceans have um, increased in noise by 10 decibels, which is actually a lot, and it's the same frequency that because of shipping, but it's the same frequency the blue whales all talk to one another and the blue whales worldwide have actually shifted their frequency. They've gone down to try and maybe move out of this out of this frequency. Which you explain that they actually talk over massive distances. Yeah, um, thousands of kilometres. So those sounds have to actually travel enormous distances through the... And people know this for sure because they've watched whale song change over time yeah. as a result of people in, of, of whales, sorry, not people, uh, whales in the northern hemisphere starting a song and then it continued in the southern hemisphere thousands and thousands of kilometres away. Yeah. But what's really interesting about sound is that when you look at baby fish, baby fish have googly eyes and huge ears. Guess what who's listening? Baby fish. That's how they find home. If you muck up with sound, that's the other thing that's preventing fish from finding home, is all this noise. But is the noise that significant? Is that, that much? Or is it because the technology that we use actually reaches 
you know, has a dramatic footprint, if you like. What ships are really, they have that low droney noise. It's the same as the big blue whales. It's, it's, it, it travels a long way. Low frequency sound travels really, really so well. So the propellers. Yeah, well, yeah, the propeller. And baby fish... And the engine noise. ...can actually know the sound of a reef. Oh. They've shown these yeah. fish that are just swimming willy-nilly in the sea, and all of a sudden, <gasps> I hear waves. I hear waves. Ah, home is this way. So then they start swimming home. And they go straight into a propeller. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully not. But they're depending on sound to find home. Brad, you're busting to say something. Oh, it's just that um, I think, you know, we're never going to do it without shipping, and there must be hundreds of thousands of ships out there these days, probably a hundred years ago, they were all sailing around and not making too much noise. <laughs> Today they're all full of um, big diesel engines or, or whatever it is. And uh, so, um, unfortunately, I think it's something that the, the uh, fish are going to have to adapt to because um, we're not going to do it about our ships. You know, the ships are, are what, um, I suppose, creates international trade and um, it creates jobs for people. and. Uh, I suppose I've got a plasma TV at home, most people have one, and it came on a ship from China. So, yeah, but that's um, the truth, but you know, by the same token, if you wreck the fish habitat, and they, the baby, you know, we have replaced around Sydney Harbour, we've got a lot of sea walls, where 200 years ago we had rocky intertidal reef. And that rocky intertidal reef with waves crashing back and forth made a noise. We no longer have that habitat. So regardless of whether the presence or absence of fish, we don't have the habitat creating the signal for the fish to find home. Yep. But the military have done massive amounts of research on making their ships really, really quiet so that other people can't find them. So there's this uh, technology, stealthy ships. technology out there, except, was, cause, again, because I did acoustics, so I did this thing in Adfa for a a while learning about it and um, they were talking about this one ship that they'd spent massive amounts of money on to make it really really quiet and it just kept being incredibly noisy but not all the time and so they spent years because this thing was really expensive and they couldn't work out why it was making this noise and then they found out that one of one of the young mechanics would put his um, his spanner like he just had this habit, he carried it in the back of his pocket and then he'd take the spanner and he'd put it in his place and it happened to be from the engine to the hull. So it was actually, what it is, is that it's like a, a channel that draws all the noise from the engine straight out to the hull. And basically the hull is like, it's like a speaker, it just sings. And so it was just sending out this massive amount and it took them two years to work it out. And so our commercial ships, if we use that same technology and actually put into, with time, put into our into our commercial shipping, the impetus to be... So dampening and making them more stealthy, but then the military doesn't want to share that technology. No, it's <laughs> really <laughs> simple. You just have to decouple the inside to the outside, and that's where, like, a spanner by a mechanic from the inside to an outside is just channeling it through. So it's just kind of making sure you've got that, you know, a gap. Probably it also helps if you don't play Metallica underwater. <laughs> that's um, right. Yeah, yeah, and, and I see, um, yeah, good opportunities for that sort of um, improvements to be made because um, the car that your grandfather would have driven, the old Model right. Ford or whatever, would have made a Model T Ford would have made a hell of a racket. Whereas now you jump in your uh, nice shiny new Hyundai and um, you don't even know that it's running if you're sitting there idling. So they've used the same stuff. They're just insulating the, the noisy things. Well, maybe we're just going deaf from all the background noise. Now we talk about um, opening up for questions, so I'm going to hand over this microphone. Um, to the lovely Fiona, who will um, take your questions if you have any. Questions? Yeah. questions anyway. you've, um, you've, you've talked about a range of things, and um, I guess as a sort of come away kind of statements from this, we've, we've heard some very depressing things, like 80% of the krill is lost and the whales are starving and the baby fish can't hear. The only sort of happy thing I heard is that we can basically eat any fish that we like in Australia, and I feel great about that. <laughs> Can you give me uh, something positive the, to take away in terms of what we as consumers, I guess, can do um, towards preserving our oceans or what, what just we as people can kind of keep in the mind in, in terms of preserving our oceans that we can do just at this kind of, you know, simple level as being an everyday person? Um, can I take that stuff? Um, make yourself aware of where your food comes from. So um, if you do go and buy a piece of fish, 
us, the guy who's selling it to you, where it came from. Is it imported? Did it come from Australia? Has it got thousands of food miles attached to it? Or is it being um, brought to the shop by uh, the local guy who's um, you know, fishing in the local area and um, you know, fishing under our management regimes and, and our environmental standards, not somebody else's, and fishing in our clean environment as opposed to um, some of the other areas that produce seafood in the world that um, are definitely degraded. One example I always think about was when I was a boy, the Vietnam War was on, and the Yanks were sending big 52 bombers over and just drenching the place in Agent Orange. Okay, the whole countryside, the, the forest was denuded because it was all bombed with Agent Orange. Where did all those organochlorides go? They went into the waterways. They're in the rivers there, you know. That's where farmed fish comes from. It comes from Vietnam. It comes from Thailand. Um, buy Australian stuff, and you can you can be assured that your government and your managers are trying to look after the resource on your behalf. Because the fishermen are out there catching the resource on behalf of the community, um, and they're making an economic gain from it. You know, it's their job. Everybody's got a job. Some people are politicians. Some people are fishermen. But in Australia, we have legislation and we have um, codes of practice and codes of conduct that are world's best practice. So if you can, buy Australian. But Brad, if you want to glow in the dark, that's where you buy the sort of fish. Do we have any other questions? So, sorry, just to, just to add to that quickly, is that the most important thing for Australia is to come back to what Brad is talking about. We need a bit of resilience. And sure, you can look at the reefs and the habitats of the Philippines and various places that have been dynamited and poisoned and agent oranged. We haven't got that in Australia. So the most important thing is that we make sure we maintain habitat as best as possible. Uh, do, we have any, do we have any other questions? Uh, just behind you, yes. Yes, hello. I'm sitting here feeling terribly guilty about the orange ruffy. A few years ago, I was involved with the seafood company and the directorial level. And I remember going down to the fish market. They brought in a, a trawler full of orange ruffy, worth a fortune. Now, please tell me the orange ruffy has survived. And I, I'm, I'm, I must say, you don't see them around anymore. Are they, are they there? Are they, are they, have they been rescued? <laughs> yeah, been. Um, the, the orange ruffy fishery has been the fishermen have been almost managed to extinction, not the fish. So um, basically, basically, um, fish are there. Uh, they're not able to be caught. And that's why I'm so cranky about the pirate fishermen. That's what they're after. So the Australian guys who have massive amounts of their money in fishing gear, um, and they're doing all the right things, and they're supporting the researchers to get the right information, and while they're not watching, these bastards come in and just fish indiscriminately and so that's that's why it's a really bad thing. But you can still eat orange ruffy if you want to eat orange ruffy for twenty eight dollars a kilo. In Australia, yeah. any any orange ruffy that's been taken is part of a, a very managed system. Fishery. And you'll find that uh, I think around about ninety five percent of the orange ruffy that's sold in Australia is actually New Zealand orange ruffy. And, and they their um, management regimes and, um, and their laws are as um, environmental laws are as strict as ours. Yeah. Really here in Australia, um, fisheries management takes an ecosystem based view of things, whereas um, it's not a single stock so, uh, view. Don't you think the whole idea should be more a global resource and not individual countries? Like we shouldn't be talking about an idea of like, we shouldn't be talking about an idea of like it's individual countries. They've got responsibilities, but it should be a global resource. It's, like, you can't distinguish between the Southern Oceans and, you know, South American Oceans and, you know, it's all, mm. it's all the same. I agree that the environment doesn't care about borders, yeah, yeah. but isn't the issue that jurisdiction is an issue of jurisdiction? There is no global governance that covers this. Well, the UN should, like, change that. Like, we should have a UN distinction that decides oceans are not you know, it's a national, it's an international resource, not just a... Well, to go back to what Brad said, if we really wanted the UN to be the watchdog for the ocean, you'd need policemen every in every corner, and that's unfortunately not the case in the Southern Ocean, there's no one watching. Mm. So if anyone's got to make a buck and 
has got a factory sheep to pay off to its shareholders, it's not going to be worried about international, about following the rules. Should it be up to Australia to like actually manage the resource a lot better? No, Australia's not doing such a bad thing with its fin fish. Well, we should have more like fishermen out in the southern oceans actually controlling it's in the middle of one of the worst oceans in the world, it's and it's, it, it's so expensive and dangerous to be there all the time. It's actually a really it's dangerous. Uh, it, we, were, we were actually here, we were talking about before and how much it would actually cost. And we were I don't know if you remember last year and the year before, there were, you know, the Navy was out chasing pirate yeah. fishermen, and they went on for weeks and weeks where it would have cost millions upon millions to chase these guys, but they got away. Why do you think countries don't have the population to control our resource? It's also because the oceans are huge, yes. and we have very few, you know, We'd reduce the unemployment rate. <laughs> we would certainly do that. Um, can what? we take a question here? Can we take a question here, madam? Uh, what about manu manufacturing krill and putting more krill into the ocean? The Japanese farm krill, um, and but the krill stock's been really being down as a symptom of bigger things and that it's it's a symptom of, of more carbon in the atmosphere and, and back to the what can we what can we do that the government will only do what we want them to do and spending lots and lots of money I think it was about 42 million dollars was put into like whale research about you know developing non-invasive techniques to you know really combat the Japanese we're taking them to court perhaps if we had more effort on you know spending resources and time and effort about our carbon emissions would actually be much better spent. To answer your question, krill is a very special case. If you know the life history of the krill, it's fascinating. What the krill do when they want to reproduce, they go into deep water, 100 meters. Then they spawn, and these embryos develop as they come up through the water mm -hmm. column. And then when they get to the stage where they can actually have a fully developed gut and they can start feeding, what do they feed on? They feed on the phytoplankton which is under the ice. Over evolutionary time, krill have evolved with ice. If there's no ice, there's no krill. And regardless of the aquaculture intention, unless you want to grow big uh, aquare, uh, aquaculture system, so you've got wonderful icebergs fitting on top of your baby krill, you're just not going to have baby krill. So if we don't have ice, we don't have krill. And in general about aquaculture, generally um, you need to put more resources into aquaculture than what you take out of uh, at the back end. So, so, it's, so it's an inefficient way so to produce. Are you promoting no. aquaculture? <laughs> Look, aqu aquaculture has its place when it's done done well, and it and once again it um, um, uh, the the people that are doing it uh, do it in um, I suppose in an environmentally sensitive way. Um, now, just to characterise it, if you've got a big net full of salmon and you're feeding the pellets of whatever you feed it, you've got a monoculture. So when you have a monoculture, you also create all sorts of other problems that lead away from that. You've got effluent problems, uh, disease. It, disease, characterise it by, um, uh, by a farm. You, you, you till the land, plant a um, field of wheat, and what do you actually do? You need to spray it with chemicals because you've just created the Garden of Eden for locusts. So you need to spray the, spray the wheat with chemicals to keep the locusts down. Similarly with aquaculture, if you have a monoculture of anything, um, you have, um, I suppose, consequences that you don't necessarily uh, um, bank on before, before you start it. But having said that, um, I don't mind aquacultured salmon. It tastes nice. Oh, we've got a question around the back. Hmm. Hi, Linda. Uh, Brad, can I direct this to you? In terms of the um, uh, differentiating or having consumers differentiate between uh, well harvested fish and those that are not so. Obviously the supply chain ends, if you like, with the big colds and woolies and we see the, the Asians 
you know, supplies of fish and so forth. I, I, I'm just interested to know two things. One is, would there be sufficient safe fish, so far as you're concerned, to be able to supply Australia um, with Australian stock, safe stock, if you like, and so that we could actually just embargo the, the uh, Asian fish? And the second is, given that we're all very increasingly sensitive about avoiding the caged, you know, chickens and so forth. If we were to put a campaign together to migrate uh, us, or, you know, consumers from chickens, say, to fish, would there be sufficient volumes to be able to, to convert that protein? Okay. Um, here in Australia, we import almost 50% of our seafood products. We also export large amounts. So we tend to export the um, high value stuff and uh, import uh, uh, things like uh, cheap prawns and uh, um, cheap uh, fin fish. So um, firstly, trade embargoes, I don't think they work anymore. We've got this globalisation and it's, it's here to stay. Um, if you um, try to put trade barriers up, um, there's all sorts of economic reasons why, and political reasons why they uh, get knocked back. Um, so I don't think that that would ever work. Um, I think that um, really we need to once again backing up what um, Marie said was about it's about habitat. If we look at sustainability and production holistically rather than just the harvest side of it, we need to look at um, enhancing our habitats and, and and making some of the things better that we've um, um, that we've degraded over a period of time. So uh, if we can improve our, our habitat, we, pr we improve our production and say, yes, there, then we would be able to, uh, um, to feed ourselves. It's interesting, but here in Australia, we have um, uh, 9 million square kilometres economic exclusion zone. We have 9,000 fish fishermen. So there's more than 1,000 square kilometres of ocean for every individual fisherman in, in Australia. So we harvest our fisheries at a rate something like 2% of Thailand, uh, our wild fisheries. So there, there are people that say that uh, our fisheries can be um, harvested at a greater rate. Um, we look at uh, the fisheries in Western Australia, for example, uh, there's um, a marine Commonwealth marine parks process going on all the way around Australia. Um, in WA, uh, the uh, conservation-aligned um, organisations want to see 30% of the ocean um, set aside as a marine park. Uh, Western Australian Fisheries released a report about six months ago that said, in actual f fact, 93% of um, waters attached to Western Australia are pro already protected from trawling in one way, shape or another. So um, we've got to realise that um, um, there's resource out there we should be managing it for sustainable production and we should be really looking at the issue of food security for ourselves in our own backyard, doing the right things by our environment. Well, I would, I would add to that. I mean, the, the, there is a website you can go to, Sustainable Fish. It's run by Mbari, which is the, um, uh, is the um, aquarium in Monterey Bay. And literally, you can sit in a restaurant with your iPod and you can say, all right, what shall I order on the menu? And it'll tell us pretty quickly whether you should order that mahi-mahi or you should order that salmon or you should order that kingfish. And I actually think if we actually stood for buying sustainable fish, we think Australia would, be, would come up trumps. We've got to stop buying non-sustainable fish. There's plenty of tasty fish out there that are fish sustainable in Australia and we should just focus on them. Yeah. One, 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 one more thing, there's an ethical issue here as well, I think. We import a lot of um, seafood from Southeast Asia. Um, in reality, we're buying people's food because they can't afford not yeah, to sell it exactly. to us. Yeah. Um, and um, that's their only source of protein, um, but they can't afford not to sell it to us. So, you know, there is that ethical issue there, so you know, we really should be looking at sustainable production for our own population.
Jeez, Brad, you don't make it easy for people, do you? <laughs> You're getting to the point, though, that what can we do as, as regular people, I think is what the, uh, Linda was asking about, and that's, you know, having a list so that you know what you're buying. It would be useful to your Coles and Woolley, knowing, you know, what's locally produced or under New Zealand rules, which you say are just as good, what's locally produced and what's not. Do we have another question? Um, this is not so much a question, but I just wanted to point people's attention to the fact that the Australian Marine Conservation Society has released a sustainable fish guide and this has a list of uh, seafood which they classify as um, good because of the way it's um, farmed or because of the population levels and the okay and the ones that you should avoid. So if you're interested in that guide then you should check out their website and you can obtain the guide from there. Can I just add a little bit to that, the accreditation schemes, um, I saw a presentation at um, uh, the last Seafood Directions Conference, which is a, um, an Australian um, seafood industry conference, and uh, the presentation was about accreditation schemes, and uh, uh, Duncan Suter, who gave the presentation, said that uh, he had found around about 400 accreditation schemes worldwide, and he'd only investigated 19 that were active in Australia at the time. So. There's plenty of accreditation schemes out there. Unfortunately, they don't all come up with the same answers. And they all don't have the same criteria to measure sustainability. So when are we going to get a good criterion for Australia? Um, well, in reality, the, the question was put to Peter Garrett about um, two years ago uh, at a meeting that I was um, at with him. And it was it surrounded the, um, the use of um, compliance. In his... In his, um, in his uh, Capacity, capacity as, capacity, as, as environment minister. Which is not a bit, but not capacity as leader of Mid-Ottawa. No, 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 the capacity as um, uh, yeah, environment minister. And it was, it was about the use of compliance to the Australian EPBC Act yeah. um, for accreditation for Australian fisheries. Now all fisheries in Australia have to comply with the, with the EPBC Act, which is the Environmental Protection and Bio, Biodiversity Conservation Act. So they're all measured against that, and if you don't, if you don't um, uh, come up with a tick, your fishery gets closed down. So um, the question was asked of Minister Garrett, could industry use that as an accreditation? And um, he was very adamant about the fact that he didn't want to see the, that uh, industry's uh, compliance with that act, or fisheries, different individual fisheries compliance with that act, used as any sort of accreditation. So what that sort of means is that the fishermen are, are being are paying to be measured by the government against the government's sustainability criteria. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of other people out in the marketplace wanting to charge the fishing industry to accredit their products. So um, It's a mess. It's a big mess. It's an absolute mess. And that's one thing we need should to write some to the, new, the new environmental minister. We should all write him letters. He's got to get his act in order with respect to sustainable fishing in Australia so we can all know what to buy. Who is it? Greg Combe. Oh, oh my god. The new, the, new, uh, the new fisheries minister, uh, the new environment minister is Tony Burke. It's Tony Burke and he's, uh, he was the former fish, fisheries minister. So he's across a lot of these issues. Well, you're right, because Greg Combe is climate change. Yeah, he's right, sorry. My apologies. So here we We have another question here. We have another question? Just a quick question. Um, do you think that we can ever restore the oceans to what they were? pre-industrial revolution? Absolutely not. <laughs> Actually, that's a subject of our next club, Cosmos. Uh, would the Earth be better off without us? You should come to that in about this time. Uh, yeah. Listen, uh, before we go to the next question, uh, Fiona is holding up a black box. A very elegant black box. very elegant black box, which is where you should put your answers to the trivia questions in there if you want to win all those prizes, okay? So um, fill out your... Um, Fill out the uh, form that's on your, uh, on your table and, and drop it into that box and we'll do a draw at the end. Which I should have mentioned earlier, my apologies, I should have mentioned this earlier because um, now some people may not have time to rush through it. So well, I'll actually do it as the very last thing at the end of the night. Okay? We can have another question while people are... Uh, well, I just got to answer, to, to, because you've given very short shrift. Um, I just uh, was at a uh, timeline... The one thing we have to be aware of is shifting baselines. And us scientists would love to go back to the Jurassic and have everything wonderful, pre-human, 
but we can't go back to the Jurassic. It's called the Anthropocene, which is the eos of the era of the Earth's history, which is dominated by humans. We can't get rid of ourselves. So we have to live with the fact that the, that the world is not what it was before we were there. There's a very nice set of pictures from the Florida Keys from a fishing competition in 1964, around the Bay of Pigs time, where they had the, the um, Nassau Groper and various lined up fish. And these were enormous fish, and sailfish and swordfish. And then there was a fishing competition last year. And the fish were all, and to use American terms, less than a foot. So they had 1964 and 2010 and the fish were several order of magnitude smaller. We're not going to go back to 1964, but we're going to make damn sure with the things that we've got now that we can't let it get any worse. Good point. Um, I think we're, uh, we're going to go to one last question. I've done this round the wrong way, guys. I should have done the trivia uh, a little bit earlier. And, and told you about the box. My apologies for that. So, um, has anyone want more time to fill in their forms, or have they got? So this gentleman does. I have a brain snap. You got a brain snap? Anyone else need more time, or they already filled their forms? It looks like you're the only one. We Brendan. can all watch him. And <laughs> we can wait for you. We we'll just watch you. And wait. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 are you going to heckle again? No, no, no. Not heckling. <laughs> the idea of extinction. Right? <laughs> Does anyone know the idea of extinction in the oceans? Like, no one has any idea. We've lost lots. In yeah. fact, they think that the marine system is more vulnerable to, to extinction than the terrestrial system for because of ocean acidification, fishing, all these other anthropogenic things happening. Um, but it's the hardest environment to monitor. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's really tricky. What about the Great Barrier Reef? I'm always looking at that. The question was uh, the, the question was specifically in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, how can we measure what what we've lost there, or, or if we can't measure that, what can we do to to ensure that we can measure that, you know, now or soon? Well, I don't think we've lost that much really? because the Great Barrier Reef was a, has been a marine park for a very very long time. And what we've lost are the big fish. We've lost the wrasse that were the size of a dinner table. We've lost the sharks that were five meters. We've lost the big ones. But we haven't lost the species. I'm a surfer, I don't mind them five meter sharks coming. This is <laughs> no, 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 it's just that there was these massive fish in the in, first in the Capricorn Bunker group, which were fished in the in the night. But that was the time when they had the turtle. So they were lost by fishing rather than being lost by lack of food. And yeah, food. it was just game fishing at the time. So we're not going to go back there. That raises a question: Are there are there some species that actually? Yeah, our impact in the terrestrial environment has led to some rubbish species coming along, <laughs> feral species and uh, weeds and a whole range of things that uh, we try and suppress. Is the same happening in the oceans? There's some species that are now blooming that we, we should try and pull back. We have no choice. Uh, what's going to happen is there will be a new status quo. With, where it's called a cosmopolitan biodiversity. We have species like Prosostrea gigas, which is the Australian oyster, which is in Canada, Japan, Africa, Europe, Australia. So what's going to happen is we will have the same niche, which is the same place in the environment, occupied by non-native species, which will probably provide the same ecosystem services because it's what's called ecological redundancy. We will lose biodiversity, but it's not doom and gloom because it'll be replaced by something else which is not native, which might do the same job. So it's globalization in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sir, you have a question. Uh, just a quick one. And like, have you guys heard of the uh, global census into marine life that yes. recently occurred? According to that, by the year 2050, uh, at the rate we're going now, we will see the entire extinction of basically uh, fishable uh, waters or fishable land sort of stuff, <laughs> I guess, obliterated. Uh, do you think that 
uh, you know, at the rate we're going, we can stop that. With the population obviously climbing to almost seven billion. Well, firstly, yeah, you mentioned population, and that, that's a huge, a huge pressure. But, but I think what you're what you're um, referring to is um, uh, a paper written by um, Boris Worm that was picked up by the End of the Line movie, and really that was. Um, was uh, flawed science because um, what the science uh, was based on was um, they used um, catches of fish from commercial landings of fish as an indicator of uh, uh, fish population health. Um, but what they didn't factor into it was the fact that um, a lot of fishing effort has been taken out of the world's oceans. So um, if you if you look at uh, any fish stock that's fished at a certain level, and then you take the fishermen away, and nobody's catching the fish anymore, statistically it looks like the fishery's collapsed, whereas in actual fact, it may um, be um, in a better state than what it was previously. Now, um, Boris Worm and uh, Ray Hilborn got together, who were uh, at different poles of this argument about the world's oceans about to collapse, um, and did some uh, work together, and, um, and uh, Boris Worms retreated from that statement that there'd be no fish in the oceans by 2047, I think it was. And I agree. I mean, the, the one thing that really gets my nose out of joint is my fellow scientists that are the doom and gloom, doom and gloom, uh, chicken little, the sky is falling. For God's sakes. We've had changes ever since humans arrived on the planet. But it's quite true. We are losing species at a place of knots on, in the sea just as they've been losing at a pace of knots on the land. That's the bottom line. We are losing species. Yeah. And we're losing species for a whole plethora of reasons, from mismanagement to climate change to pollution. So we are not going to have the same status quo that we had before the Industrial Revolution. There's no going back. We're not going there. But it's not a case that um, species never disappeared before. Spe extinction has been a, a, a facet of, of history of the planet since the 95% of everything that ever lives is extinct. So, but it's just the rate of extinction that's and, suddenly high. Well, for instance, there's a sinkhole in Australia because we moved through 23 degrees north of latitude when Gondwana Land broke up. So there's no no surprise that we have funny little things like kangaroos and marsupials and what a funny terrestrial environment we have. We also have a very unusual marine environment, which is very special. We have the greatest endemicity of marine species in southern Australia. Nothing is endemic in the Great Barrier Reef. That's shared right through East Africa to Hawaii. But we've got a lot of endemic species. And we may lose a lot of them. And there's, that's just... And we'll lose a lot of them because of climate change. But we're not... It's, but they will be replaced by something else. The, the, because, and it will not be life as we know it, and we just have to face it. I'm going to have to wrap up, but rather than finish on that rather doom gloom, uh, <laughs> how about we finish on this? What's your favourite marine species? Each one of you tell me. My favourite species is a brittle star. And why? Well, they're so interesting. They move around the um, sea floor in stealth like little snakes. They're lovely. And they're quite beautiful as well, very colourful. What do they eat? They're suspension feeders, so they just they they don't have any big impact. They just eat phytoplankton. And they go really well with sea cucumbers. Yes. I see. Um, my big blue ring octopus. Um, big <laughs> well, I grew up in Queensland, in a big old Queensland on the beach. And as a kid, that's what I used to do. Is I collect blue ring octopus, and I had tanks of them. And that's what I wanted to do: is study their venoms and toxins. They just bleed. And you started stalking Levin Seals. And I ended up stalking Levin Seals. <laughs> uh, my favourite marine species, I think, would have to be the um, the Australian tall willowy blonde um, <laughs> in a bikini. <laughs> for the <sleep> <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> All right, thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> uh, before we wrap up tonight, uh, we uh, and I thank our, our fabulous guests. Uh, before we wrap up tonight, we thank our fabulous guests. Of course, we have the all important door prizes and the uh, the trivia prize draw. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, impose upon our jo our uh, panel tonight to actually draw from the attractive Cosmos. Uh, box. So if you come on over to Fiona, uh, Fiona's a barrel girl. I've taken out the wrong answers because there were a lot, so it's not as many now. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so let's go through the let's go through the questions. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll draw one, and if that one has the correct answer, uh, then the first correct answer wins a, fr a free one-year subscription to Cosmos. The second correct answer wins a stylish Cosmos backpack, which is about which. Ben will no doubt show it to us in a moment. There it is, Dan is doing it, there it is. And uh, the third correct answer will win a Cosmos t-shirt. So okay, for the, we're gonna, you have to put them. Okay, so Brad, take the first one. Yeah, hold on, hold on. We'll, we'll go through, the, so the question is, which of the following species has the highest biomass? That is, if you put all the members of the species together, which would weigh, species would weigh more? Is it A, sardines, B, humpback whales, C, Antarctic krill, or D, common jellyfish? You've got me thinking about, um, you know, whale poo and being a scuba diver. You've really got that in my head now. I can't, uh, can't shake that. So, um, do any of you know what the answer is? Yes, it's krill. It's got to be krill. It's krill. So, uh, do we have anyone chosen krill? Yeah. Except you don't know about the deep sea. Yeah, actually. That's from the are massive. Okay. Which of the following known species has the highest known total biomass? Krill. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you for cooperating. And the answer, the correct answer is krill. Is krill. No. And the no. answer was what? Yes, it is. Please do. The, the winner is. Drum roll. The, the, winner, the winner is Daphne Cook. Yay! Yay! Where are you, Daphne Cook? Hey. Well done, you won a free subscription to Cosmos. The second uh, question is uh, so we'll keep that for this winner. That's the winner. Right over here. Uh, the second question is the ceiling can is a distant relative of the lungfish and was believed to have uh, gone extinct 65 million years ago. Then was rediscovered in 1938. They have some very unique traits among vertebrates. These are the ones that have backbones. One of these unique traits is A, 95% of its brain case is filled with gas. <laughs> <laughs> that would float. Um, B, it has a tiny S-shaped heart. C, it has a hollow backbone. And D, it has no eyes. Which is the correct answer, ladies and gentlemen? No eyes. The correct answer is, I've got a lot of stuff big scientists, it has a hollow backbone. Yeah. And who got, are we going to correct, who is it? Kiri uh, Bilby. Kiri Bilby! Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Kiri Bilby. You have won a, co a stylish black Cosmos backpack. Thank you so much. Well done, man. And they got a cut back. They turned out to grill. Yeah, there they go. Okay, the third, the third correct answer gets the Cosmos T-shirt. Which one is it that we're giving away? Where's the average? Which T-shirt? Which one? Which T-shirt is it we're giving away? Is it the Isle of Science? Oh, they can choose. Yeah, okay, they can choose. There's a, a, a selection. Um, there's, uh, so the question is, what is the average temperature of the Earth's oceans? Is it A, minus 4 degrees centigrade, B, 2 degrees centigrade, C, 7 degrees centigrade, or D, my personal preference, because that would be nice and warm for a swim, 13 degrees centigrade? And the correct answer... It would be B. Well, it's nice to see that Maria's got one question right. <laughs> because of the deep sea. Yes, of course, it's average. Average is the, is the killer in that, uh, in that question. So, do we have an answer? Do we have somebody with a, the an answer? The is um, Daphne Cook. <laughs> Daphne Cook again? Holy cow. She filled in too. Um, disqualification. 
We can't, we can't have, we can't have you clean too. Daphne, you've been outed. Marlene Wolgroski. Marlene Wolgroski, where are you? Well done, Marlene. You have won your choice of uh, one of the Cosmos t shirts. You got all three of them right. You got all three of them right. You know, unlike Maria, who only got one of them right. Oh, okay, well done. Now we're going to do the raffle draw, which is basically the. Um, uh, Fiona's just getting that for me, or is it Becky? Who's, who's getting the raffle? Here's the door prize.